Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, or my guest today is Barry Kibrick. I'll tell you all about Gary in just a moment. Grace Under Pressure is that show that deals with what's too often dismissed as this uh, the soft stuff, the caring, the commitment, the courage we exert toward others. And when you do it as a leader, as you will very much discover that Gary Barry Kibrick is, uh, you do it for extraordinary reasons, to create new and better things and bring people together. Welcome, Barry Kibrick. So, hey, John, it is a pleasure to be with you, sir. I love great. your work. Well, it is my honor. Uh, you are the first Emmy winner, and not only Emmy winner, three-time Emmy winner uh, that I've had on my show. So you're also the, uh, Barry Kibrick is the uh, recipient of the 2019 Ellis Island Medal of Honor for service to our nation, and for his work as a producer and host of a terrific show on PBS called Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick. And in that show, Gary has uh, interviewed just about everybody. <laughs> and when I mean just about everybody, I mean uh, from in the entertainment, uh, sports world, you name it, Ron Howard, Ridley Scott, uh, Neil, DeGrasse, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, John Favreau, Pollard, Elmore Leonard, the author, uh, actor, Jack Klugman, um, and people that uh, many of them will know in this show, Marshall Goldsmith and Gary Ridge. So, uh, Barry, it is such a pleasure to have you on our show today. Thank you. So, uh, again, it's my honor, John. Your work is uh, inspiring, and uh, I'm, I'm really uh, taking the fact that you invited me. Well, that's yeah, great. So now you're in the hot seat. All, all your many guests have been. <laughs> so tell me the origin of Between the Lines. Where did that come from, Barry? So well, The concept initially started on a train to Europe uh, while I was in Munich. <laughs> a and, train uh, to Europe? <laughs> as a concept. What happened was I was sitting across from a classical pianist who was uh, a professor at New Paltz University. And he was going to a Deutsche Grammophon concert to hear the greatest classical pianos. And I was hemming and whoring. I didn't know how to ask him this, but I, I finally did. I said, you know, you're a great pianist. So what separates you from Vladimir Horowitz, Rachmaninoff? What's the difference? And he says, Mozart says it very clearly. It's what's between the notes. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And then what happened was I, I was in Hollywood for 15, 20 years producing comedy specials. And then I ended up working for NBC. And what happened was the head of the programming at NBC moved to Chicago's PBS. She loved my work and said, do you have a show for me? And I said, you know, I've always been thinking about the queenness. And uh, I did a show on books before. What if we tried between the lines, how much do you have? And I'll, I'll make it happen. She says, I have nothing. I said, <laughs> myself. And she says, yes, it's on your dime. So I did it on my dime. Obviously, that's when I became a host. And, uh, and that's how it started. And I then funded the show myself for 26 years. Great. Well, you know, the betweenness is a great thing. And I know the Mozart thing. It's also uh, Miles Davis said simply something similar. But so in our world, and thing. most of our audience, most of our audience is in the human development field, and we have we love models in our world. And I like to say that when you look at a model, be it for behavior or strategy or whatever, what is so important is, i.e., the connections, but the spaces between the boxes or the shapes. And so that's right in line with your show. So um, as the producer now um, of your show, what do audiences expect from an interview show with artists and uh, people that you've interviewed, so. Well, it's very funny. I always say I am a horrible interviewer. And I am, I am though a very good conversationalist. <sighs> and that's what makes the show very different is I never have once asked a question on my show. What I've done is always taken the words of the author, of the musician, of the filmmaker, use those words to then take a deeper dive between them. And because like you said, it's really what lies between those words, between virtually every aspect of life where you see the awareness, where you can detect the importance 
where you can almost pause literally on the threshold of what is the ultimate important thing to find out. I love that. That's, this is a very, I want on the surface, esoteric, but actually very basic and very human. And, and by doing that, it's accessible. So, yeah. That's my whole goal, in fact, is it's so esoteric. How can you bring it down? I want every Uber driver and cashier to really understand this, not just those people in the fields of philosophy and physics or business. I really think that it is such an important concept that I really want to bring it not down to the level, but up to the level of the average person, because we keep forgetting how brilliant our average person is. We think for some reason of these elite cabals, and the truth is they know virtually nothing compared <laughs> to the regular man or woman on the street. I love that, yeah, uh, Barry. That is a moment of grace right there, you know, uh, recognizing the humanity within all of us and the intelligence of it, it's even though people like me sometimes hide it. Or <laughs> So well, you mentioned something, and I love the idea of you draw the, drew the distinction between interviewing and conversation. Have we lost the art of conversation, uh, Barry? So Well, I, I don't know... I won't say it's lost because, you know, it reminds me of like the, the story of Pandora's box. Everything escapes but hope, right? So maybe we have lost it for now, but no, it's still within us. Conversation, storytelling is the first thing we as thinking people did. That's what the cave drawings are. are they? they are stories of life. Right. So we've been right. telling stories and analogies and tales and narratives, that's really the best way to unveil the truth. If you're just giving facts and data, you don't know the real truth. Great. So now I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot. What makes on your show, and you've interviewed so many great people of accomplishment in many different disciplines, what makes for a great guest? So. I think a, a, a great guest, first of all, appreciates the fact that you're doing this with them. Um, a great guest also is someone who is not reading off their script, so to say. Many writers have a certain belief in what they're saying, and then they have sort of a PR statement of what that is, and they answer things that way. What the great interviews that I've experienced and that make the conversations so alive is when they, because of me, I will take the lead of that, I get them off their script. And when I get them off their script, the truth comes out, and that's when they themselves even find awareness. That's the whole purpose of the show, in fact, is that my guest, myself, and at the time my viewers, now my listeners, all of us become aware of what's out there and how important our role is in it all. That's a good lesson. And I will tell the audience, uh, Barry, you are a new member of 100 Coaches, uh, Marshall Goldsmith's show, and you interviewed Marshall. And what you just said is getting people off script. Essentially, that's what coaching does, because when we approach someone to coach them, work with them, they have a set mode or thinking or whatever, and as a coach, we need to put them, I will say, sometimes in an era uh, or a position of, quote, discomfort, not to cause pain or anything, but to get them to rethink assumptions for them. So it's to think of how I can do things better, differently, whatever for you is to stimulate thought and, as you said, truth, which is our game and aim in coaching, too. So there's a great parallel there. <laughs> oh, not only that, but when I have been semi-coached a little bit by Marshall, a little bit by Gary Ridge, also a fellow named Toby Trevitan, who wrote the narrative playbook. They, I'll never forget what they brought out. Here's the thing that I think is so important. I want to know two things, either my idea being validated that I always had, or I want to learn something new. And the great coaches do those things. They either validate what you've been doing or they correct in a certain way that gives you awareness. 
That's so true. I have heard have so many folks. And when I speak to coaches and um, and my clients that I've had, they say, tell me if I'm on track or not. And of course, that's not my decision to say, but sometimes it's a validation for what they've done, whatever. And they know in themselves what's what they're doing. But our role like you with great conversation and interviews to bring out that inner story, but also, you know what else you it's a learning about self. I think that when we do a great interview, we learn something ourselves as the interviewer, but also when I'm interviewed, I learn something about expressing a thought. I go, ah, I'm re I phrasing it in a new way. So, you know, that, well, we're, we're brothers from another mother. What can I tell you? <laughs> John, because that's exactly how I feel. And that's exactly uh, the way I approach things. And even when I've been asked to consult on businesses, I do so with the background of my work as, as a business person, because I, I am a businessman. I do this. That's what my living was made out of. I'm an entrepreneur and I've done that, even though I've worked for networks and different things like that. But um, doing that and when you really sense that everyone is benefiting, that's wow. when you feel it right in the soul. That's when you know that you're going to translate that to your, if you're a manager, to your team, if you're a salesperson, to your customers, if you're an executive, to your entire CEO suite, whatever it is, when you feel that and, and a little dash of passion as well goes a very long way. That's great. So, uh, Barry, many of the people um, watching this or listening to it later or um, our fellow members of 100 Coaches, our authors or working to, on their first book. What if, And now um, we always encourage every author to you know, do as many interviews about the book once it's out and get it publicized. What advice would you have for maybe a first time author going in front of either a camera or a microphone to talk about his or her work? So. Kind of a cliche almost, but authenticity is so important that you are very involved, even if your message is almost identical to someone else's message. Like you said, there's different ways of saying it, and you never know which one's going to catch somebody. So I think for a guest on the show, you have to, on my show or any show, you have to be able to A, Really open up and be appreciative that you're there. B, go between the lines of your own words. Dig even deeper. If all you're going to do is tell me what's in your book, then why would anyone need to buy the book? What everyone <laughs> needs to know is the reason why they should buy the book. And those are the things that, again, lie between the lines, not the lines themselves. And when you give people that reason that's when people go out and i could see it i i monitor guests and see their amazon ratings go in after i'm done with it and when i have seen things jump literally millions of ranking points on amazon and it's only because we had this conversation that excited people to pick up the book well just what you said that is uh barry kibrick interviewer or conversationalist slash entrepreneur because <laughs> you said the operative word why should someone buy your book <laughs> so and well, everyone said everyone has a book in them there's yeah. no doubt about it there's a million stories in this city as the old tv <laughs> Oh, well. well, story is so important, and, and, and that's what intrigues us, and that's how we learn as humans. And sometimes, certainly in my world, um, many of us have a, if it's a business book, we'll have directives or models or whatever in the thing. But what people want, okay, I got the process, but tell me a story about X who did this or didn't do this. So that, that, that is a, uh, a word of, of wise. Would you agree with that, uh, Barry? So Not only would I agree with it, but that's what I'm doing with my book. I'm giving my philosophy, backing it up by everyone from literally Socrates to uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson or from Barry Ridge to, to uh, Marshall Goldsmith. Okay. So I, I'm well, using them as my, my support. And then I'm giving my theory and my words that are different. And yet, hopefully, I, in fact, a beautiful example is a brand new book out now by Temple Graydon. Do you have familiar with her? Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. I know her. She's that autistic woman who, mm -hmm. and her book is 
think visually. It's all about people think differently. Some think visually, some think orderly, some think uh, by the word. And if you can make connections on all those levels, that's when you have a gem. Oh, that's great. Well, since you opened the door, Barry, tell us about your book, what you are writing. What's the genesis of it? And um, do you want to share a title? So, yes, so. it's easy. It's between this. That's the <laughs> I title love it. Book. And I have uh, been I've been researching it now for about, well, since my, as I said, since I was 18 years old on that train in Europe, it started in me as doing. And we are so unaware of what is between the seen and the unseen. And when we could become aware of all of it, whether it is the fields of energy, whether it's on a micro level or a cosmic level, whether it is in business, whether it is in education, look at all of our institutions now that are suffering. They're suffering because we're in silos and no one's looking between those silos. No one's going between the left and the right. They're only looking at those two positions, not realizing that there's not another position, but there's 30, 50, maybe a million other positions. That's great. And um, I'm just sort of, as you explain this, I'm thinking of my own work of grace, which I view as the catalyst for the greater good, and also the concept uh, of community. And what I think grace does is foster that ability of connectedness. Is there a connection between betweenness and connectedness? So well, the second sentence in the book is simply this. If you look between the thresholds of life, that is where you will find grace. <laughs> well, I can't, and this is before I met you, John. It was funny. I looked, at your, I looked at your books and I go, oh my, because that is where the grace lies. That is where the, it's almost that unknown, that, what is it the French say? That je ne sais quoi, that little special something that you can't put your finger on it, but yet everyone else can detect it when they see it. And that's what's interesting about grace too. Grace is something that I would never say that I have grace, but I would hope that other people may think I have grace. You know, so grace is something bestowed upon you rather than what you do. What you do, if you do the right stuff, so to speak, is be perceived as having grace. Oh, that's great. And, and um, well, you know, you are joining us from Los Angeles, I think, right? And so, yes. okay. Well, one of my great examples of grace, of course, and you may know the story and you may have interviewed him, is Father Greg Boyle in East LA with um, Homeboy Industries. And yes. he's all about this connectedness and radical kinship as he talks about working with um, uh, ex-gang members to help them find community as a way of navigating a new way of life. And uh, what an extraordinary story that is. And there's between, because between this, if you would, because there's the city of Los Angeles and all of its different cosmopolitan entities. And then there's those who have been forgotten perhaps those in the gang community and, and Father Boyle look, works to bring them together. So great, great story there. So also, um, one of the other guests I had on my show who does the same thing from Los Angeles is a fellow named John Hope Bryant, who literally puts money into the communities that he knows have true entrepreneurial spirits, but they haven't been exposed to the capital. They haven't been as, even exposed to the concept of being an entrepreneur. And I think that's, again, where our educational system is. There's not a single course on entrepreneurship, unless you get into the college level, of course. Yeah. But we should be teaching these things, even as young people that, you know, going out on your own, what does it do? How do you deal with basic economics? How do you do deal with civics? My gosh, we've, we've lost so much of that as you said before, but as I say, hope, they're, they're still there and they just need to be brought out. Hope is so important. And without it, um, you know, Napoleon has said that leaders are dealers in hope. Um, and and I think there there is a, do you see a connection between betweenness and hope? So, 
Yeah, I think again, when you when you look carefully at things, you literally, I believe this sincerely. Uh, Ron Darren, I'll give you an example, was a guest on my show who wrote The Orbital's Perspective. He was a gentleman that spent the most time on the space station. And when he looked down and saw the world from up there, he had such a different perspective on life. And hope is what he shares with us because when you see that we're all connected, you see that there is something greater than just your individual life. And and, and I don't mean that like your individual life isn't great. It is tantamount. Without it, there'd be nothing for you. So, But it, you see the world with a different, I, I like to say with fresh eyes. And that's, oh, and that's so important. And you as an entrepreneur know that fresh eyes approach because that's where the opportunities lie. <laughs> so, Because no one's ever done that before, but whoa. And um, and that's good. I, I like it. And I'm all with you on the civics where you have fallen short educationally in doing that. But I liked your idea about the entrepreneurship too, because, and, and we often see this so much in our uh, in immigrants who come here and see America still as the great dream uh, and and where I can make something. That's basically self-entrepreneurship, even if they work in a quote for someone else in a, uh, a more conventional uh, occupation. They had to get up and go to come here and make something uh, of an opportunity. So I think, by the way, to add on to that, John, I think you can be an entrepreneur in a complete bureaucracy. I actually- oh, interesting. So how does that happen? I'll tell you, I, when I started my show, uh, after a while, it started getting picked up on all the PBS stations, but Los Angeles, and I was doing it out of my own home with my own money. And then I got involved with the PBS station in Los Angeles, KLCS TV, and they loved what I was doing, could not believe the cost I was paying to do it. It was so inexpensive. And they gave me an opportunity. But what happened was in order to continue to do it, I had to become part of that system. I wasn't allowed to do it as a independent contractor after a few years. There were strings. <laughs> but I, I knew that those strings were important for me to do what I wanted to do and to continue doing it. And I was going to help them in a certain way. So there was a bureaucracy, the Los Angeles Unified School District, 700,000 students, God knows close to a half of that, as many teachers and, and bureaucrats and everything. And yet I operated entrepreneurially in that system. And you can do that. You can. And I did. And, and sometimes did I get in trouble for it? Oh, yeah. But uh, <laughs> but you know something? It is. What's that old saying? It's better to do and then ask permission. Later. So <laughs> well, I, I would do things no matter what, if I believe them to be right, ask permission later. But I still treated myself, my crew, whenever I had to take them, anyone else I was dealing with. I dealt with them as if I was the CEO of my enterprise. That's great. And you know what? That's an uh, ample illustration of your whole concept of betweenness, because there are rules and regulations and right in between. You can you can find some way to do it. But you're but here's the thing here, you, Barry, your intention is good. It's not self. It's not self promotion. It's for the product, the service that you're offering. It's not about Barry. It's about my show and bringing it to a new audience or, or doing things new and differently. Am I correct in that? So it's the only way, in my opinion, it works. And every time I had a guest who thought differently, who thought it was about them, that's when, again, I, I was always able to steer it still to give value. But those were the ones that just kind of made me a little sick. I got to level with you. And here's the, the great irony of it is some of the quote, most spiritual People supposedly were the least concerned with what they should have been. And oh, so, so uh, should we call that an act or what? <laughs> I don't think, you know what? I think sometimes people, I like to give the benefit of the doubt. I think sometimes people just begin to believe themselves too much. 
Yeah. <laughs> and not, not leave enough room for the potential of other theories. Besides, <laughs> Barry, you, Barry, you are a man of grace. You are speaking kindly <laughs> of, of humanity. Um, sadly, Gary, we or Barry, we could keep running uh, on, and going on the show. And I would have loved to hear Gary and Barry interview because <laughs> I would. I'm glad I didn't have both of you there because I would have fumbled. So, Gary, uh, Barry, <laughs> excuse me, my Never apologies. Problem. Oh, I'm, getting, you want. I'm getting old. Uh, anyway, um, so tell us a story. Uh, I ask every guest a story about grace. Do you have a story you'd like to share, Barry? So yes, I I, I do, and, and it actually was a time when I was not graceful. I actually, and it only happened once or twice, but the one time I remembered, I was livid at someone who said something about me and not me wouldn't bother me but my staff and i lost it and i so concerned myself with grace that the minute i lost it i realized oh my gosh i better fix this right away and i did and i not only apologized to the person but i apologized to the person to all of the person's employees because I did this in public, I apologized and believe it or not, we ended up with the best working relationship. So sometimes grace comes out when you're the least graceful. And if you correct it, you become more seen as graceful than you would have if you never made the mistake. So that's my interesting story about grace is sometimes it blossoms out of sometimes being the least graceful. That, well, that's the story of my life because I know how to put my foot in my mouth pretty <laughs> well. Um, but you know, Gary, you illustrated something that I believe in very strongly uh, and grace can be transformative as well as transactional. But what you, you got into the humanity of grace. People with grace are not saints. They are not holy people. Well, they may be, but I'm, uh, they don't want to be called that. But we are human. And grace enables us to recognize our faults and come back from our mistakes. And when we say, as you said, oh, I'm screwed up here. And you had the courage, the guts, the gumption to say, I'm sorry. That's an act of grace. So great. So I appreciate it. Um, Barry, we are uh, coming to the end. Do you, how can people find you? So I, I think the easiest is my name. It's barrykibrick.com. And then you can find out all about me, all about the work I'm doing and things like that. The nice thing about having the name Barry Kibrick, I am the only Barry Kibrick on the planet. And that's it's the truth. I'm so I'm you can Google Barry Kibrick, you can go on to Facebook Barry Kibrick, you can tweet Barry Kibrick, you can do anything with Barry Kibrick you'd like. Uh, and I really do love to hear from people. I've never not answered an email, uh, I've always answered every email, even when they got up to between 500 and a thousand a day. I would still figure out a way to answer everyone, no matter what it took, even if it was just a brief thank you for sending, but I will do it. So you can reach me at barrykibrick.com. Perfect. And we will put barrykibrick.com in the notes uh, so that people can recognize it. Gary, it has been such a treat to interview you uh, because you are set the standard. I'll say it for interview shows, even though you call yourself a conversationalist, which in some ways, Gary, or Barry is much harder having that conversation, doing the research on the individual and finding out the truth so he or she can share it with the rest of us. What an honor to speak to you today so the honor was mine john and as always grace under pressure to you as well sir thank you with that we'll go out